Pleasure and Owens um, here in Atlanta, Georgia on a gloomy day here in Atlanta. And um, just happy to have this opportunity to um, share my uh, information with you guys. Um, and um, the name of my project was titled Post Adoption Services and Supports in Georgia. And that was what families need and what families want. Uh, in the state of Georgia, um, the state is made up of 159 counties and we have the most counties, um, the second most counties in the country next to the state of Texas. So Georgia has 159 counties and it's divided into 14 regions and um, each county operates a local defects office and staffing is comprised of both uh, regional staff and county staff. So we have a large area to cover and um, sometimes it can be tricky ensuring that services are able to uh, spread statewide. Uh, throughout the MPLD program, uh, we wanted to highlight issues impacting African-American children and their involvement in social service systems. And in this slide, we take a look at some of the overrepresentation in Georgia. So African-American children make up about 32% of the child population in the state of Georgia. And they make up about 46% of the foster care population in Georgia. African-American children are 50% of those children who are waiting without an adoptive resource. As compared to white or non-Hispanic children are 54% of the child population in Georgia. And they make up about 53% of the foster care population. And white and non-Hispanic children are about 49% of the children waiting without an adoptive resource. So here you can see uh, the disproportionate numbers uh, impacting African-American children in care in Georgia. Uh, in the beginning stages of the fellowship, we were asked to develop a PICO statement to sort of drive our research. So my PICO is as follows. If funding and policy decision makers are provided data regarding the need and effectiveness of post-adoption services in Georgia, including current funding allocations for these services, would this information contribute to plans for increasing funding support? Uh, action research was used to collect data to support our need for additional post-adoption services. A survey was used to collect data on post-adoption service needs in Georgia. In the past two years, surveys were sent to approximately 15,000 adoptive parents. Careful examination of the data collected from the surveys that conducted in 2018 and 2020, provided information needed to confirm the need to increase the awareness and funding for post-adoption services in our state. All post-adopt families requiring services are not able to receive supports due to inadequate funding. And sometimes vendors just do not have the resources to uh, serve everybody that may need services. So this slide, uh, shows data from a survey done in 2018 in the first graphic. And this survey was updated again and modified and used as part of my ARP in 2020, which is shown in the second graphic. So the survey was a two-part survey. We asked questions about what families needed and what families wanted. The survey was sent to 7,100 parents in 2018. It was updated and again sent out to about 8,600 adoptive parents in 2020. And the survey results show many more families in Georgia need access to services after their adoption is finalized. Defining uh, dis disruption and dissolution and the meanings for the purpose of this research I thought was important. So the term disruption is used to describe an adoption process that ends prior to the finalization of adoption. And the term dissolution is used to describe an adoption and ends after finalization. So both are important, but just wanted to clarify one happens before and one happens after. It doesn't make them good, but uh, you know, just to clarify what, that they happen at different points in time for the purpose of this research. A selective comparative analysis was conducted in reviewing what the literature says about disruption and dissolution factors to parent responses in the survey. So in the next few slides, we'll examine this data in a crosswalk. In the crosswalk, I really wanted to highlight three key factors related to adoptions based on the literature reviewed. 
we wanted to look at agency, parental, and child factors that contribute to failed adoptions. So in the literature reviewed, uh, inadequate or insufficient information on the child and his or her history was noted as a contributing factor to disruptions. And the results from the Georgia survey, we learned most adoptive parents, regardless of the number of children they had adopted, reported that the information they received on the adopted child was very accurate or quite accurate. We also learned from the literature reviewed inadequate parental preparation, training and support led to disruptions. And the respondents from the Georgia survey reported that training and education for adoptive parents, parent to parent support and advice networks and support groups for adoptive parents and children as three of the unmet needs of adoptive families. Insufficient services was also noted in the literature and about 68% of the parents who responded to our survey and who said they had been impacted by COVID reported that they have been able to receive needed services. Adoptive parents also reported the top unmet post-adopt services in Georgia were mental health services and educational advocacy and support. Also the literature discussed staff discontinuity and high turnover rates in the United States. And that impacts performances and outcomes for children and families involved in child welfare systems. We learned that there's, there was a 39% turnover rate in the state of Georgia in fiscal year 20, and about a 30% caseworker turnover rate was the national average. And I think these numbers show, you know, with such high turnover rate, it's hard to build comp a competent adoption workforce that can adequately serve our families. And unfortunately, sometimes it can lead to disruptions or dissolutions. And some of the main parental factors here in the crosswalk uh, listed in the literature in the survey, family survey, we wanted to look at the three main factors. So a lack of social support, whether that's formal or informal, a lack of experience as a foster adoptive parent or newly matched adoptive parents who do not know, who hadn't had enough time to really know the child. Um, the results from our Georgia survey, we learned that support groups or parent to parent networks are needed. About 95% of our parents surveyed that used our online parent support groups were actually satisfied or very satisfied. 84% uh, of our adoptive parents that used in-person support groups for adopted children were very satisfied or satisfied. And here we'll take a look at the child factors that are associated with disruptions. Uh, from the literature review, we learned that when two or three siblings are placed together, they had a higher risk for disruption. Ironically, when four or more siblings were placed together, they had a lower risk for disruptions. So in Georgia, we learned from our survey that about 56% of our children adopted statewide are part of a sibling group. We also learned from the literature that children with physical disabilities, behavior, emotional, or even sexual behavioral problems are generally at higher risk for disruptions. Uh, the results from the survey showed us that mental health services, whether they're in-home mental health or residential mental health services, is the most requested service in Georgia, followed by educational advocacy services. About 53% of our families in Georgia reported that their adoptive children had some type of behavioral challenge. About 22% of our families reported that their child had a PTSD diagnosis, and about 23% of our families reported that their child had a diagnosis of attachment disorder. During the research on what adoptive families need, we learned adoptive families do well when accessing post-adoption services. And studies prove on average that families with access to competent post-adoption services are less likely to experience disruption or dissolutions. We know that many needs go unmet after the adoption is finalized. Some of the needs Georgia parents voice were mental health services and educational advocacy services. Post-adoption services were also instrumental in assisting families during challenging times. Our adoptive parents reported that monthly adoption assistance payments, the adoption assistance Medicaid, our special service funding, and our crisis intervention program was all noted to be doing well and families really enjoy utilizing those services. Uh, in the data collected, we wanted to use this information and allow it to serve oops, as a call to action. Uh, we want to improve our 
post adoption services program by engaging additional vendors to provide services that we currently do not have and to close service gaps. We want to expand our service array as best we can in the state of Georgia. And that's what this data um, has really helped us to begin to look at. Uh, with an abundance of research done on factors contributing to adoption disruptions and dissolutions, the human cost must also remain at the forefront of our work. Uh, Post-adoption programs, they play a critical role in providing necessary support and services that families need to face challenge, challenges throughout their adoption journey. Uh, a lack of services and other support programs can lead to re-entry into foster care or even dependency on other state-ran systems, such as the mental health system, or even the justice system. So on the next slide, we'll take a deeper dive into what that human cost looks like. So studies have shown that when children age out of, age out of foster care um, and, and are not equipped with a forever family, there's a higher probability of involvement with mental health or even prison systems. Adoptive parents need adequate training before and after the adoptive placement to deal with complex behaviors and emotions associated with a child who's experienced trauma. Uh, Post-adoption services should be effective and accessible to prevent re-entry. We learned that African-American children are at higher risk of re-entry. And generally this is caused due to the loss of a primary adoptive parent. In Georgia, the majority of our adoptions happen by single females. So you can imagine if that single female uh, takes sick or some kind of health issue becomes or she passes away, um, a lot of our children, unfortunately, can come back into care uh, based on that reason, and that's also a problem nationally. Uh, Retraumatization and maltreatment while in care, uh, homelessness, uh, mental health system involvement, whether on behalf of the adoptive child or the adoptive parent can prompt reentry. Uh, substance abuse issues can prompt reentry, and even prison system involvement can prompt reentry into care. So in addition to the human cost of reentry, we cannot forget the fiscal cost of failed adoptions. Uh, in this slide, we looked at a few areas that can drive costs up for our public agencies. So reentry into foster care can lead to an increase in services and costs of higher level of cares. And all of these issues drive costs way up. Uh, agency costs for case management services and even the contracts that a lot of our agencies across the country enter into to provide services for our children can drive costs up. Uh, so adoption is really our most cost effective option for agencies. And also it's our most permanent placement option with long lasting positive outcomes. And here in this slide, we'll take a look at some of the national trends of adoptions or post adoption. We recognize that many children adopted from foster care have significant problems, which just do not simply go away once an adoption finalizes. A guide was published by the National Resource Center for Diligent Recruitment at Adopt US Kids called Support Matters and it cited numerous studies that concluded the amount and quality of support that adoptive families receive when parenting a child with a history of abuse, trauma, or neglect is an important factor contributing to the permanency of the family. Providing support helps families meet the diverse needs of children and youth and encourage and placement stability throughout the life of the adoption. With support, parents are better equipped to remain committed to the adoption, remain effective in the adoption and cope with challenges that, are, that parenting children of traumatized children uh, experience. Effective post-adoption supports and services can help families with the, raising, with, with the challenges of raising a child with disabilities or other challenges to improve the family's ability to really understand their child's needs a lot better. And I think that's an important piece. We have uh, children who've been traumatized, but it's more important for our adoptive families to be able to really understand those needs. And I think that better equips them into how to uh, maybe assist children with those needs. And here's a review of our current services in the state of Georgia. We have the A-Team program, which provides adoptive children and teen support groups at local state universities and colleges across the state of Georgia. We have the Resource Center, which provides information and referral services for adoptive parents. The Resource Center also employs resource advisors who assist adoptive families with locating resources in their local area. So like I mentioned earlier, Georgia has 159 counties and 
You know, we place children all across the state and those services look different from each region. So it's a good idea to have a handle on what's available in your local region and the resource advisors do a really good job with helping our families with that. We have the reunion registry program, which provides search and reunion services for adoptive persons and families. They also provide non-identifying summaries. They search for relatives. They provide individual consultation and also group support meetings. Uh, we have the crisis intervention program, which is really our most popular program. The crisis intervention program provides short-term in-home counseling and crisis stabilization services to adoptive families and community resource referral services after the crisis is stabilized. And again, this program is so popular and I think largely because the counselors, there's a team of two to three counselors, master's level counselors that travel to the actual adoptive home. And I think that goes over well for families. So they don't have to travel all around, you know, Metro Atlanta. I'm sure you guys have all heard about uh, Metro Atlanta traffic uh, and just even some of the rural areas in Georgia. So this is a really great uh, post adopt service for us. It's widely used um, and it's really popular. We also have the ADOPS program, which provides services to strengthen families. ADOPS provides uh, trauma-informed counseling, parental coaching, and also intervention services. Post-adoption vendors in Georgia provide, like I mentioned, services in all 159 counties. Um, we make adoption placements statewide in all 159 counties, so vendors have to be able to reach our families regardless of where they may be in the state. Uh, however, sometimes there's barriers to services. So based on the feedback from the adoptive parent survey, here we'll look at some of the barriers that prevented service provision. Uh, a lot of families reported that they lived in rural areas with little to no access to adoption competent services. So that posed a barrier. Uh, they mentioned transportation as being a barrier. Uh, Medicaid, sometimes gaps in Medicaid coverage. Uh, most children receive an adoption assistance, they receive Medicaid. However, Medicaid does not address every single issue that a child or a family may be faced with. Uh, some of our families reported that they were just plain all ashamed to ask for help. Um, some of our families even mentioned that they didn't realize they were that far in the woods before they decided to ask for help. So stigmas with asking for help was uh, a barrier to uh, services and one that I did not think would be uh, mentioned as much as it was, but um, it was mentioned. It was mentioned a lot. Also, uh, ethnic and cultural issues can be a barrier to services. Sometimes, you know, it may be language barriers, uh, religious barriers, or just different cultural uh, issues that prevent uh, families from receiving services. And as we all know, COVID nineteen has pretty much changed the world that we live in. Um, our vendors throughout the state of Georgia, they worked during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, initially at the onset of the pandemic, uh, they didn't provide a lot of services. I think they were just trying to figure it out like most of us. Uh, however, vendors eventually got back on track and provided necessary services to families. They relied heavily on technology uh, to reduce the spread by not, you know, uh, by social distancing, but also uh, they use technologies such as Skype and Zoom and other video-based communication apps to make sure that they remained in contact with families who were experiencing some sort of a crisis or challenge despite of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's something we're really proud about. Our vendors were able to make things happen despite the pandemic. So here's the fun part. This is the beginning stages of success. Um, our original plan was to collect data and meet with our executive leadership team to request additional funding for our post adoption services program. By the grace of God, luckily funding became available prior to that meeting. Uh, we received $5.9 million that was awarded to the adoptions budget. And with that $5.9 million, we plan to expand our service provision with current vendors as well as seek out new vendors to provide services that we may not currently have in closed service gaps. So we were really excited to receive that $5.9 million. So in addition to the $5.9 million we received, we also received an additional $4 million over the next two years. And we'll be able to use that $4 million solely to support the 
adoption assistance caseload grow. So the good thing is our, as our adoption assistance cases have grown by almost 700, we don't have to tap into that $5 million to you know, cover those federally mandated payments. So every penny of that $5.9 million will go towards improving and strengthening our post-adoption services program. So uh, the Georgia Office of Planning and Budget uh, gave us that $4 million. We weren't really expecting that $4 million and we definitely weren't expecting the $5.9 million. So I guess you could say Georgia is rolling in the dough right about now. We're really happy about it. And I think it's gonna give us an opportunity to really close some uh, service gaps, primarily in the areas of educational ad advocacy as mentioned earlier, as well as mental health. Um, a lot of our children in Georgia are being um, uh, faced with you know, potential uh, PTRF services needed and um, there's not a lot of services to um, help families with that and they can be very expensive. So I'm looking forward to uh, figuring out ways we can close those gaps. How did MPL PLD impact me? Um, I've truly enjoyed being a part of the MPLD program and you know, primarily the interactions with all you fellows and definitely <laughs> Sharon Lynn and Arlene. Um, you know, I learned a lot about disproportionality issues, policy issues, and even you know, ways to expand my leadership. Um, one of the main things about this program that really um, stuck with me was you know, the encouragement to utilize data more in our uh, to access to effectively assess our outcomes and even drive our decisions. So um, I'm really happy to be uh, put in touch with the data queen, Ms. Sharon Lynn Harrison. Um, I really appreciate that. And I think this is something that I'll be able to kind of use, you know, in my leadership style in the future. Um, also, you know, access to many resources, other resources that are applicable in uh, my everyday work. And I think more importantly, um, I think um, the biggest thing out of this program that I took away is just having um, the opportunity to build relationships with everybody on the call. Um, I really enjoy working with the fellow fellows. And um, I think, you know, these are relationships where, um, you know, I'll be able to reach out to you guys or you guys can definitely reach out to me in the future. I know a lot of us have exchanged LinkedIn's um, over the course of this past year. And I hope to do that with the rest of the fellows who I may not have had a chance to connect with. But I think, you know, a program like this, you know, we are the second cohort and I, and I do feel like, you know, we'll remain in contact um, throughout the rest of our careers. Uh, and just want to send some thank yous, um, obviously, to Arlene and Sharon Lynn. I know some of them coaching calls I got on you guys' nerves and I, and I didn't mean to, but <laughs> I just needed to understand things. And definitely I got these Cokes in the mail. I owe you guys Cokes, so they will be in the mail. Um, also wanna thank the DOP US Kids and the Children's Bureau. I mean, I think to have a vision to, um, you know, develop such a program was really, um, was really great. And um, hopefully this is a program that can go on for years and years on end. And um, also wanna thank my MPLD mentor who unfortunately couldn't be here today, Ms. Lamarva Ivory. And, everybody over at the Georgia DHS um, executive leadership team for their support over the last um, year. Um, I also wanna thank my own staff at the DFAC Social Service Administration Unit. Um, I won't tell any tales. I had to delegate a lot of tasks to um, stay on top of my research during the course of this year, but I, I, you know, they stepped up and were able to knock things out and um, that allowed me time to do uh, the research I needed to do and attend the coaching calls and everything else. Um, I also want to thank my fellow co cohorts from 2020. Um, again, you know, it's been a pleasure um, getting to know you all, and I definitely hope to stay uh, in contact with everyone um, in the years to come. So if I'm ever in your city, I'll reach out. You reach out if you guys come to Atlanta. Um, and lastly, here's my contact information, uh, my email, phone number. Um, I can be reached at that information, and, um, you know, if there's any maybe questions about this research or um, I'd be happy to help anybody in any way, uh, any way that I can. So um, again, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you to um, Adopt US Kids, Sharon Lynn and Arlene. It's been a pleasure being part of this program.